Good afternoon and welcome to the Black History Month celebration of the Eastern area of the Lynx Incorporated. I am Carol Seal Council, Chair of the Eastern Area Arts. We are so delighted to be able to present to you today a virtual tour of the outstanding art collection of the Hampton University Museum. But let me take a moment and thank the Hampton University Choir for that stirring rendition of Lift Every Voice and Sing. Wasn't it wonderful? This afternoon, we will first visit the Hampton University Museum, which was founded in 1868. An interactive question and answer period will follow. At 1 p.m., we will transition to part two of the program, a student workshop on museum careers. In between, you will see a performance by two very talented young musicians from the Hampton area, and you'll take a short trip to an African-American owned restaurant in Hampton. I am sure you will enjoy this afternoon. But right now, I have the pleasure of introducing the Eastern Area Director of the Lynx Incorporated, Shawana Tucker Sims. Shawana has served in many national and area positions of the Lynx Incorporated. She is a member of the Waterbury, Connecticut chapter. In private life, she is the Chief Talent Officer of the Connecticut State Department of Education. I love that Shawana is always encouraging and inspiring us to grow, learn, and reach for higher heights. Please welcome Dr. Shawana Tucker Sims. Thank you so much, Carol, and good afternoon. I am proud to bring you greetings on behalf of the officers, leadership team, and over 4,600 members in 80 chapters from the Eastern area of the Lynx Incorporated. Happy Black History Month. That stirring rendition of the Negro National Anthem by the Hampton University Choir was a great way to start today's program as we prepare for the visual feast of touring the Hampton University Museum, this nation's oldest African-American museum. The Lynx Incorporated was founded 75 years ago and our mission is to enrich, sustain, and ensure the culture and economic survival of African-Americans and other persons of African ancestry. Education and celebration of the arts has always been an area of focus for bringing that commitment to life. Our theme in the Eastern area is embracing our legacy, cultivating our future. And that is exactly what we are doing when we promote and support the art and artist of the African diaspora. Our artic artistic expressions help preserve our history, convey our current struggles and achievements, and highlight our aspirations for the future. We are in for a real treat today. We are indebted to the leadership of the university and the museum for your willingness to open up this historic collection and share your expertise with us. We are so glad that several of the team are joining us today and will be introduced throughout the program. Thank you for all that you have done to make this possible. It promises to be a memorable experience. This is the last in our virtual museum tours in cities that have both links chapters and museums dedicated to African-American life or culture or featuring exhibitions of art or artists of African descent. I want to personally thank Joyce Melvin Jones, president of the Hampton chapter and all of your members for your support of this event as well. The Eastern Area Arts Facet and Programming Team continues to raise the bar for delivering innovative, informative programming through what we call Art Six Feet Apart. Thank you, Valerie Cooper, co-chair of the Eastern Area Arts Facet, Carol Council, chair of the Eastern Area Arts Facet, Nakina Douglas Glenn, Program Co-Chair, and Anna Maria Bishop Harris, Eastern Area Program Chair of the Eastern Area. 
In closing, exposure to the arts is an important part of anyone's ongoing education. It is also a career option that many have not thought of or explored. We're pleased that immediately following the tour, there will be a student workshop on conservation and curatorial museum careers. In the Eastern area, we are also proud of the way we are supporting the education of HBCU scholars in general through the generosity of the Eastern Area chapters, link members, and friends, we donated over $350,000 in the last three years to the HBCUs in the East, including Hampton University. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Mrs. Norma Harvey, who we are proud that she is a member of the links, and Dr. William Harvey, president of Hampton University. Enjoy the tour. Welcome. Welcome to Hampton University, one of the wonders of the world. I say that because look around us, the prettiest campus in the entire world. And then look at some of the things that we've got going. We've got four satellites that are in the air right now. We have the world's largest proton beam cancer treatment center. We've got a giant antenna that can detect storms and hurricanes and tornadoes up to 2,000 miles away. And we have a world-class museum. One of the things that uh, I hope that you look forward to is having that virtual tour of the museum, where we've got uh, things such as 15 Henry O. Tanners, including the banjo lesson. Dr. Thaxton Ward is going to take you through that as well as some other things, and I really hope that you can enjoy it. Not only that, once this pandemic dies down, I hope that you can come and view it for yourself, because it truly is one of the wonders of the world. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Thaxton Ward, and I'd like to share a bit of the history of the city of Hampton with you, as well as Hampton University before we start our tour. Uh, we'd like to also thank you all for including the Hampton University Museum in this wonderful Black History Month presentation. And I don't know how many of you know that the city of Hampton, uh, particularly Point Comfort, which is today's Fort Monroe, is known as the first landing of Africans. Uh, 1619, the first Africans were brought to the African occupied Point Comfort, to the English occupied Point Comfort, which is today Fort Monroe. August 25th, 1619, 20 or so Africans arrived from Angola um, on the White Lion. This city is also so very important to African Americans in our African American history because Fort Monroe was also known as Freedom Fort. In 1861, three men escaped from slavery to Fort Monroe and was a uh, kept as a uh, contraband of war. And so more and more African-Americans moved to the area, came to the area for freedom. This is the genesis of the founding of Hampton University, which again was founded in 1868 by Samuel Chapman Armstrong. And General Armstrong decided that he would also start a museum. So Hampton, as you all have found out, is the oldest African-American museum in the United States and one of the oldest in Virginia. So now I'll turn on the video so that you all can enjoy, I hope, a tour of the museum. Thank you so much and we look forward to speaking to you later. Oh. 
Hello, I'm Dr. Vanessa Thaxton Ward, director of the Hampton University Museum, and I would like to welcome you to the museum for a brief tour of our wonderful collection. The museum is as old as the university, founded in 1868, and we have collected many, many objects throughout the years, and we're very happy to be in our current space, the Huntington Building, which was formerly the library. So we have been able to put over one, more than one-fourth of our collection on display, and we would just like to share a bit with you. We have here our changing exhibition space, and we change our exhibits here usually about two times a year. Currently, we have on exhibit Spirit of the Renaissance, the Art of William H. Johnson and Marvin Gray Johnson. They are both artists in our permanent collection, and these works are from our permanent collection. Sometimes you may see them upstairs in our 200 years of African-American fine art, or you might see them traveling throughout the United States, or they may, may be in our art storage. But we welcome you to come back when we reopen to have a guided tour of that space. Now we'll take you into our African collection, which is also a very old and dear collection to the university and the university museum. Come this way. The African collection is as old as the university collection, one of the older collections as well. Many people may not believe that. Um, this gallery, we named it Power, Beauty, and Community because the pieces that we share with you all come from, of course, a community. Many of them are pieces of royalty and power, and um, they are also very, very beautiful. We have here before us William Henry Shepherd. He was a pioneer in the Congo. He was one of the early students here at Hampton, and he decided, because Hampton was doing a lot of missionary work in his early years, and so he decided he wanted to become a missionary. He left Hampton and went to Stillman College, where after graduating, he was sent by the Presbyterian Church into the Congo, or today may be known as Zaire or the Democratic Republic of the Congo. On his way in, William Shepherd learned the language, and so when he was captured by the King's soldiers, he was not um, persecuted as many other foreigners were. He was taken before the king and presented to the king, and the king realized or felt that he was a reincarnated king, uh, a family member who had returned. One, because he was the same complexion, and two, because he learned the language. So we have, for example, some of these wonderful pieces that Hampton purchased from William Shepherd in 1912 where he collected these pieces and documented how they were used. So for example, we have these wonderful royal pieces used by the king or his soldiers or some of the chiefs. We have this powerful mask that you see on display that um, shows the strength of the Kuba people and the strength of the king. And you can tell that by the piece on the top that looks like an elephant trunk, which is a symbol for um, strength as well as the leopard skin in the middle, that's for strength and agility and speed. And then you have the raffia that is surrounding the bottom of that mask, which is, of course, the tree bark from a tree. And so this is made into a um, type of fabric or textile that would be used to decorate many of these pieces. Um, and you also see lots of cowrie shells. And we all know that the cowrie shells are indigenous to the region. And then you see the trade beads. And that's because the Cuba was trading with Europeans. So we also see European uh, glass beads incorporated into many of these pieces. These are wonderful treasures that were, again, collected by William Shepard and documented. We have lots of material on these um, pieces in our archives. We have continued to our relationship with the Cuba people, and you can see that by this wonderful um, mask that we have here. It's called a broom masquerade figure. Now, the current king of the Cuba people, younger brother came to Hampton in 1990, and he came to get his master's in business. And so he uh, assisted the museum in collecting other pieces, 
as well as translating many of the works that were in French into English so that we could uh, develop our wonderful labels here. So this Broom masquerade figure is a very strong, tall looking person and um, he would be raised to do this position. This masquerade figure comes out when someone of royalty dies and it's to help them transition to the other side. When we moved into this building in 1997, we wanted to incorporate the fact that these traditions still continue, that they are not stagnant. So when you visit us, you may see photographs of this masquerade figure um, in action during a real ceremony. We also have a photograph of the current king, and he's dressed in his ceremonial dress that you can um, see that some that we have in our case. But you would also see him dressed every day in typical wear, uh, a lot of times in his business suit. They do a lot of uh, business with Belgium, of course. And you know he's the king because of the headpiece. So we have wonderful pieces from the Cuba. And we say also in our um, description of this gallery that, you know, things are beautiful. So there are like ordinary everyday items like uh, cups. And we also have an enema. Uh, <laughs> that people have used, but it's beautifully carved and decorated. And so, you know, these things are some of the examples of what we have. We're going to move a little bit and talk a little bit more about the Cuba people because they are really well known for their Cuba textiles. The Cuba people um, make these textiles. This particular one is a burial um, piece or a woman's long skirt and the one up top is a burial piece. Now what's interesting is that the men will go out and gather the uh, pieces, which is the um, bark from the tree, and then it would be treated and then used by some of these tools to weave it. And so I mentioned the raffia before, which is the bark of a tree. And so this is an example of the tools and a raffia before it becomes these beautiful textiles. And again, they're worn for special ceremonies and the one up top would be worn as a burial piece to wrap the person in before, um, during the ceremony. And we have a, a picture of that actually as well. So we have a whole wall of Cuba pieces that you'll see when you come to visit us in person. We also have other pieces that are used for transitional pieces in various cultures. The thing that is interesting about Hampton's culture or campus in our collection is that many pieces were collected by students um, or given to us by students who graduated from Hampton. This piece, however, is called an Ngungu mask. It's from Nigeria and it's from the Yoruba people. This piece um, we love, um, it's a wonderful piece and it really connects us to our African-American heritage because it looks very much like a strip quilt that may have been made by your grandmother. And so um, that's one reason why we're so drawn to this piece, but also the power of this piece. And so in this gallery, we have three pieces in these very large cases that are used for burial and to help people transition to the other side. Now we have a bit of Ghana gold that we want to share with you because if I showed you everything in this African collection, we would be here all day. So we have this section that looks at the Akan um, and other areas of Ghana. This is a uh, regalia that would be worn by the queen mother. And so of course, you know, Ghana is the gold coast and so you see lots of pieces here, and they're either gold-plated or full gold. And again, these wonderful rings and bracelets and necklaces would be worn by the Queen Mother. We have other pieces here, but I talk about the Queen Mother because she's really treated royally. And we see here on um, this chair that would be used to carry the Queen Mother. So she would sit in this chair and we would have, uh, there would be men to carry her. And then of course we have all of this beautiful um, kente cloth that is 
that is well known for uh, Ghana. Okay, this collection is so vast, we're going to take you in. Uh, the gallery is a U-shape, so we're going to come into this. We're coming in from, well, you could come either way. This area we uh, put up to um, recognize our current president, Dr. William R. Harvey and Mrs. Harvey, um, for their 40 years at Hampton at that time, that was in 2018. He's been here now 42 years. And so this is um, the exhibit, and we decided to keep it up because it was so popular. But this robe and um, regalia, his academic regalia and this suit, was worn by Mrs. Harvey when he became president of Hampton, and this was during his inauguration in 1979. And so we just did this as a small tribute um, for his 40 years of service and all of his work here at Hampton. The museum also has a wonderful American Indian collection. In 1878, 10 years after Hampton was formed, American Indian students came to Hampton. Our founder, Samuel Chapman Armstrong, decided that in addition to teaching African Americans, he wanted to teach American Indians. And so a group of um, Indians came to Hampton, as they say, they came in their blankets. They did not speak English, so they used sign language because, of course, they spoke their own tongue. Um, they were integrated into the classrooms with the African-American students. And by the time this program ended, we had over 65 different tribes here at Hampton um, attend. And so, again, they were taught everything uh, that the African-American students were taught. And Booker T. Washington, who is one of Hampton's most illustrious graduates, was the first African-American hired by Hampton. And he worked with the American Indian students. He was the house father in the male dorm, which was called Wigwam Building, which is still here on our campus as one of our designated historic sites. So we have wonderful objects here that look at the American Indian culture, Unlike many of the uh, off-reservation boarding schools, Hampton, although they were teaching them English and, of course, um, the other things, they also let, allowed them to continue with their own traditions. So you can see that we have this basket tree, and many of these um, baskets were made here at Hampton or were brought to Hampton from the students. But we have one of the former students teaching, Arizona Sweeney, this is in um, 1901, and she's an Eastern Band of Cherokee Indian from North Carolina. So we see her teaching the younger uh, students how to do this basket weaving. So again, a little bit different that we were also um, having these students to continue with their own traditions. However, they did learn new things, and so we have Hampton was a very self-sufficient school um, because of its proximity. Also, I'm sure because they were teaching American Indians and African Americans, they were very self-sufficient. So you see a little pair of boots here that were made here on the campus by an uh, Indian student. So our men pretty much wore uniforms. Um, the women did too, I guess. But the men wore military uniforms. And so these little pair of boots um, are a part of that. And then we have this wonderful uh, pillow with bobbin lace um, and a pillow for making lace. And that was um, in our home economic de department. And like many of the departments, when they find items, they make sure that the museum is alerted. So we acquired this pillow and these pieces of lace samples that were made in, by American Indian students here. Okay, we're gonna move through to the other pieces in this collection. And this gallery we call Enduring Legacy, Native People, Native Arts at Hampton. And so you see that we have um, a pair of sneakers. We know them as Chuck Davis, I, I know them as Converse, um, All Stars. But this was done by a young artist, Terry Greaves, who is Kiowa, and she beaded these um, sneakers. She also has some really cool beaded um, pumps with a heel like this that I would love to, to collect for our um, 
collection here. But these are used still at powwows today. And so again, these um, we're not just showing old things. We want to show that these traditions still continue. And so we also have a um, tree over here that has traditional uh, moccasins. And with these, you can see again that we have a lot of glass beads. And again, this was um, due to trade. But we also have some in here that have um, porcupine quills on them. And that was the traditional way, um, of course, the indigenous piece to the area. So they would use the porcupines, I guess, pick them, flatten them, and use um, berries, natural berries, to dye them to get the color. I'm sure it was probably a little bit easier to deal with these glass beads. And so, of course, they may trade skins or food or different things in order to gather the beads. We also have, um, again, this is a little cap worn baby bonnet, and it gives you an excellent example of what I was speaking of in reference to the porcupine quills used to decorate the piece. And then a boy's shirt here that's made from um, buckskin. Then we go around and we have this wonderful girl's jingle dress that is one of the traditions that um, continues. And this little dress was made um, for us is special, but it is also used in today's powwows. And so the little shiny pieces, of course, jingle when, it, when you dance. This piece was donated to us by um, Paulette Molin, Dr. Molin, who was American, is an American Indian, and who assisted us uh, in our former curator, Mary Lou Hulkerin, with this particular gallery. So this is our downstairs. We're going to take you upstairs where you will see 200 years of African American fine art, which is one of the most um, noted collections in the United States nationally and I would say internationally as well. So we'll meet you all upstairs. So here we are on the second floor in the rotunda where we tell a little bit of the history of the university. So I mentioned earlier about Samuel Chapman Armstrong and I just wanted to give you a little more information on him. He came to Hampton in 1868. This was after the Civil War. He was assigned to uh, Fort Monroe. And um, he decided that he wanted to start a school similar to the schools that was um, founded in Hawaii by his parents. They were missionaries there. So um, Armstrong came to Hampton, uh, worked at Fort Monroe, decided to start this school, which was Hampton Normal Industrial and Agricultural Institute. I mentioned that uh, the students wore uniforms, and so you see what General Armstrong wore. This is uh, his frock coat that he wore when he came to Hampton as a young, young man. Armstrong stayed here over 25 years and died in 1893 here at Hampton, and he's buried on a campus. And so we also have another piece that's really very historic to African Americans. This is the Pen of Liberty. We acquired this pen, Dr. William R. Harvey bid on this piece uh, several years ago, and Hampton acquired it. This is one pen, one of three pens, that was used by Abraham Lincoln to sign the Emancipation Proclamation. This one was used for the citizens of um, Washington, D.C. We also have Emancipation Oak, and the story states that um, Mary Pico was a free woman, taught African Americans who were enslaved at the time how to read and write. And of course, that was illegal during that period. It is also, so this is where they say the first classes for Hampton um, took place. And so, again, we have this wonderful pen of liberty. Now we're going to take you into the 19th century gallery where we have one of the first pieces of African American art collected by the school. This is one of the most renowned pieces in American art. This is the banjo lesson by Henry O. Tanner. Tanner um, was a good friend of a board of trustees member here, Robert Ogden. He was a uh, supported Tanner in his work. And so he purchased this piece from Tanner after the Paris, um, Paris exhibition that Tanner um, participated in, and this was donated to Hampton. 
This is one of our first pieces of African-American art. This piece by Tanner as well as the bagpipe lesson, which is also another wonderful piece. This 19th century gallery, we have um, a large collection of Henry O. Tanners, as well as other artists, um, Johnson and Duncanson. We also have this beautiful piece that was made by Thomas Day. This piece was collected by a young African-American collector, um, Derek Beard, who collected African-American furniture. This piece is by Thomas Day again as a secretary. He was um, based, he was a free man, and he was based in between North Carolina and Virginia and Virgilina. And uh, most of his items, though, have been saved and collected and are on display in the North Carolina uh, State Museum, History Museum. But um, this wonderful piece, which is really important to us as well, because you know when Hampton was a trade school, they also taught furniture making and cabinet making. And so beautiful pieces similar to this um, were also created here at Hampton. We have so much to show you because upstairs we have 200 years of African-American art. So we're gonna to move to our Renaissance Gallery, but this 19th century gallery starts us off with the pioneers of African-American fine art. The gallery here we call the Renaissance and Beyond. So we're looking at pieces from the 1920s and 1960s. One very important piece is this piece by Augusta Savage. Augusta Savage made this, this is just a maquette. It's called Lift Every Voice and Sing, and many of you may recognize this as the um, African American Anthem. However, we, we really show this piece and plan to actually put the words to the anthem up because students today, young people are not really learning this. But this is a maquette for a larger one that was built for the World's Fair that took place in New York. The original was destroyed because there was nowhere to put the piece. And so um, there are not a lot of maquettes left, but we're very happy to have this one in our collection. We also have works by Weir Mace Johnson. I told you about him downstairs, but this is one of his uh, more noted pieces as well. This one is called Jitterbugs. Weir Mace Johnson was uh, born in South Carolina, and like many of the other African-American artists during this time, he left um, the United States in order to be free um, to paint and to live, uh, as well as Henry O. Tanner and again, many others. And so one thing that um, we see with all of these sharp corners and the moves, he's talking about the jitterbugs, but he's also pointing out um, the exaggerated hand, um, the woman with the pointed breast, uh, the feet and everything, very much like African art. And of course, a lot of um, Western artists uh, are said to created that, but basically they are utilizing traditional African art to create these things, and so did William H. Johnson. You also may notice that the pieces in this gallery are a little more energetic, a little more color, uh, more so than what we found in the 19th century gallery. Many of these artists were um, migrating, um, as well as the people, that's part why we call it the Renaissance. But we just don't talk about the Harlem Renaissance, we're talking about the entire Renaissance. This piece by um, Archibald Motley is called Black Belt. And you see that these people have migrated and they're living in the city. And so this is city life. Um, you see the drop in, uh, you see the hotels and you see the busy nightlife. You know, there was, um, in all of these cities, there was a black um, belt. There was an area where blacks Reside, resided and had their own businesses. And so this is a wonderful piece uh, painted in 1943 by Archibald Motley. Okay, we're gonna move on through the Renaissance. I did wanna point out this wonderful piece by Richmond Barté. This piece um, demonstrates uh, the beauty of his work and also the beauty in labor and in work. He's showing the stevedore. This piece is called Stevedore. And, you know, during that period, uh, black men were not allowed to uh, have places of uh, importance on a ship or a dock or a shipyard. They were given labor work. And so really, I think um, what Richmond Barté does with this piece, it shows the dignity of work by betraying this man in such a powerful way. 
from um, that area, we move into, after the Renaissance, and we move into some more contemporary pieces. And I wanted to share with you all this piece by artists out in uh, California, Cabal Al Mansour. This piece is called Leave No One Behind. And this entire wall, actually, and other pieces that we have collected, this um, artist was a part of an exhibition that we do um, here at Hampton, a special exhibition. It's a jury show called New Power Generation. And with this piece, or this exhibition, we really look at uh, emerging artists. If you notice, the other artists that I, I have mentioned are well-known names in the art world. And these artists are emerging, meaning a lot of them are teaching, they're working other jobs, or also being full-time artists. And we just really love this piece. And um, it's a relatively new acquisition for the museum. But we did a, um, a project with our current students here at Hampton and asked them to select pieces that they wanted to see in the museum. And so this was one of the pieces. We also have a contemporary artist that painted or created this piece called The Entertainer. This artist, uh, Richard Ward, he used found objects as well as uh, Kamal, as you see in his piece. But these are back scratchers, um, instruments, parts of instruments. I even see a toilet stool brush here to clean your toilet. And he created this person. This is from a series called Work Songs. And it is The Entertainer by Richard Ward. So we're gonna move over to some more color. As again, you can see these colors are really popping. This is James Phillips. James Phillips is a well-known artist. Um, out of, right now, he's in Baltimore. He works at Howard University. Um, and this piece is called The Soul and Spirit of John Biggers. And we're gonna get back to John Biggers in a minute. But you can see this beautiful piece. It looks like a quilt. And I have a problem with quilters. They come in and they immediately go to touch. And of course, you cannot touch items in the museum because your oils on your fingers um, can make these things deteriorate. But uh, the soul and spirit of John Biggers, all of this geometry and everything comes back. This is a tribute to John Biggers, who was a student at Hampton. And we'll learn a little bit more about him. We're going to move around the corner here to Elizabeth Catlett. Elizabeth Catlett was a very well-known artist. She was known for her printmaking as well as her sculpture. And um, we have some of Elizabeth Catlett's prints here that range from the early 1940s until almost right before she died, really. But, you know, Elizabeth Catlett grew up in Washington, D.C., lived in the United States, um, eventually moved to Mexico where she and her husband, um, Francisco Mora, lived with their children. And uh, Elizabeth Catlett was really fighting for African-American rights, as well as Mexican rights, as well as women's rights. So you can see an example of one of her beautiful prints called Shoe Shine Boy. This was printed in 1958. It's a lithograph. And she's looking at uh, the young children here working for a living. Um, this other piece, Latchkey Kid, Latchkey Child, um, done in 1988. You know, there was a period in our history, I guess I was one, a latchkey um, child when your parent was at work and you came home from school and had to let yourself in to get your homework and stuff done. So she looked at uh, what's going on in the community. She also has a wonderful piece here. We have uh, f about four pieces of her work, her sculptural works. This one is called Black Flag. Black flag is um, made from Spanish cedar and um, is painted. And you can see it's called black flag because you see the red, black, and the green inside the leg, which is the national uh, flag for African Americans. And as I stated, uh, she really also fought a lot for civil rights um, when she was working and living in Mexico so much so that she was not allowed to return to the United States for quite a while. But this is our Elizabeth Catholic section, and we um, bring you from Catholic into our Hampton Traditions in the Arts. So when 
these people, most of the folks in this gallery were in classes. Elizabeth Catlett was here working. Uh, Charles White was an artist that came here. He painted the contribution of the Negro to Democracy in America, which was located in Clark Hall. But he also worked with these students. So we see works by Samella Lewis, who is the founder of the International Review of African American Art. This piece was done here when she was a student at Hampton. This is called Water Boy. So this was painted in 1944. She and Elizabeth Catlett were friends for years. Actually, Catlett influenced uh, Lewis to come to Hampton in the 40s. We're going to move over here to John Biggers, who was also a well-known artist. This is John's uh, student work done in 1942. And this piece is called The Crucifixion. And this piece is very interesting. You see uh, John was born in um, Gastonia, North Carolina. This reflects his hometown. So you see the cabins and the homes. And you see this crucifixion or lynching. And with Samella's piece, she was born in Louisiana. So you see the boy carrying water. They were instructed by uh, Lowenfeld, who was a Jewish refugee. And he came and started the art department here at Hampton. And he told these students, you know, they were trying to replicate European or Western um, ideals. And he suggested that they look at themselves and look at their home. And so that's what they started to do. And you can see the progression of John Biggers through the years. And you see he still has those same similar types of ideas, but he has um, incorporated more. And I told you with James Phillips' piece that we would come back to John. And you can see the quilt-like background, which is like traditional African garb. You also see uh, with John Biggers the wash tub and different things. I don't have a lot of time to go into every detail, but you all just must come and visit the museum to see these pieces up close. Now we're going to round up this tour. Um, let me show you one more thing because we can't go um, to the hallway. But I did want to show you this one piece by Reuben Burrell, who was Hampton's uh, photographer. He was the campus photographer here for over 60, 70 years. Uh, Mr. Burrell um, graduated from Hampton. And he also, after he was in the Navy, he came back here to Hampton to teach, but ended up becoming the photographer. And so this is a beautiful picture of a former trade school student, uh, Billy Smith. And I told you all that we made furniture here. And so this is Billy Smith making this um, beautiful ribbon back chair. And so I did want to show you that. Then we're just going to end this tour going back to the history. We come into this gallery, which is our Hampton History Gallery. So we end with the beginning. The history of the museum, it was called the Curiosity Room, founded in 1868, the same year that Hampton Normal Industrial and Agricultural Institute, now today Hampton University, was created. And as our uh, founder says, I wish to make my institution excel in whatever it undertakes. And so we thank you for coming to the museum. Uh, we hope you will come and see us um, in person when we reopen. And I hope you've enjoyed the tour. Thank you. My goodness, my goodness, my goodness. I have to stop and catch my breath. Dr. Thaxton Ward, that tour was absolutely breathtaking. We cannot thank you enough for helping us celebrate Black History Month and the prestigious Hampton University Museum. Um, and if you could just see the questions 
and the comments in the chat. They're coming in faster than I can read them. But I want to just take an opportunity before we start the Q&A to just thank everyone for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to join the Eastern area of the Lynx Arts Facet. I am Valerie Cooper, the muse museum liaison. And somebody asked, uh, have you done this before? Well, in, in Netflix terms, this is season five, episode one. So you have a little binge watching to do to catch up, but uh, there's, there's not gonna be one like this one. This was certainly special and unique. So let's get right to this Q&A. We have lots of questions and we saw some wonderful works that spanned several different periods. We started in Africa with the African collection. We then saw got a little taste of the American Indian collection and learned that there were actually Native American students that attended Hampton in their blankets without the ability to speak English in the beginning. They knew sign language and before it was over, there were 65 tribes there. And then last but not least, we wrapped it up on, in the second floor of the rotunda, viewing the works by 19th and 20th century African-American artists. So if you don't, if you didn't put your question in the chat, it's not too late, but we're gonna start with the first question in the chat. And it's coming in from an artist who, I believe she may be a sculptor, Manuelita Brown uh, from the West Coast. And Manuelita would like to know, does the museum currently collect contemporary African-American artists? She saw a lot of wonderful masters, but she's just curious on what the state of contemporary art is. Dr. V, I will let you answer that. Okay, sure. Um, we do, um, not as robust as uh, we might, but I think um, one reason is because we're kind of full already, but we are definitely interested in some more contemporary artists. Uh, I mentioned that we have the um, exhibition that we do biannually, the New Power Generation um, exhibition, which is geared towards contemporary artists, um, emerging and contemporary artists, and we normally acquire a piece uh, that way. But yes, we are um, interested, particularly in um, acquiring more works by women, women artists. And so I think I know that name. I think we may have talked. So um, yeah. let's chat. What's got in mind? <laughs> and, and following along, along that, um, Jennifer Holmes wants to know the process for accepting works of art. So. I'll come, we'll find out in general what that might look like, Jennifer, and we'll come back to this audience with um, further information around that. But now I want to go back to Africa. You uh, showed us some things we have not seen, uh, starting with the Kuba Wall. Well, for those of you who have not been to the museum, you haven't seen them. You have to plan a trip to Hampton and make sure you plan to spend the entire day the entire day. It's it's worth seeing um, if you are a lover of, of the arts. The Cuba Wall was one that you mentioned. You also shared with us uh, the Queen Mother's uh, jewelry, the Queen Mother of Ghana. Wasn't that jewelry absolutely fascinating, her chair? And someone mentioned that, you actually mentioned the chair she was carried in. Was she physically carried around in the chair is the question. Yes, physically, yes. The queen mother is physically carried around in the chair. Um, uh, yes, people would carry her from you know, one spot to another, I guess, probably during ceremonial um, events and activities, mm -hmm. but yes. And that chair has definitely was definitely used and it is used still um, in many contemporary awesome. settings. And uh, somewhat related to the African collection, as well as the um, African American objects, um, are the it's about the acquisition of the objects. And we know that over time, uh, this uh, phenomenal collection has developed and grown. Are the objects primarily, or were they back in the beginning uh, stages, pr primarily donated to the university or were they acquired? 
Um, well, very early on with uh, General Armstrong, he wrote a letter to his mother to ask that she send objects instead of money when he was doing his fundraising to establish the school. And these pieces were actually collected to be hands-on objects. So they were used as teaching objects. So many, of course, were donated. Um, we had some early African pieces even before the, the William Shepard collection. However, as you stated, um, as the years have progressed, we have uh, both. Some, for instance, uh, there's a collection of African pieces from Peter Koenangi, who was a student at Hampton. And when he saw that Hampton had this museum, he wrote to his father, who was a Kikuyu chief, and asked that he send um, some items from his home. So that's how we acquired those pieces. However, as I mentioned, we purchased those pieces from William Shepard in 1912. So they were purchased uh, by the university or the institute at that time. So today, some pieces are purchased and some are donated. So we have an acquisitions fund uh, where we, you know, where, where purchase pieces are paid for for them. Right. And by the way, I'm sure they are accepting donations to that acquisitions fund. If you would like to contribute to the cause, <laughs> we will also let you know how to do so as well. Speaking along those same lines, uh, I, I want to also emphasize that, you know, given the temperament of America, when a lot of these HBCUs were initially founded back in the 1800s, the HBCU museums and the art galleries, they were the first patrons of the arts by these Amer African American artists because the country at large was not purchasing their work. So in order to support these artists, to validate that they were to um, as American and official as other mainstream artists, the HBCU stepped up and purchased some of their first works. Hampton University took the lead, as was mentioned, and purchased some of the first tanners. So we want to make, an, and they've kept them. And we hope you continue to keep them so that we can enjoy them when we come to visit you or enjoy them virtually. Um, there's a few questions, a couple minutes left for questions, and they're starting to come in. There's a question, uh, Dr. Daxton Ward, about the University Museum store. Uh, it's coming in from President uh, Harvey's daughter, Kelly Harvey. We are happy to see you here today. Um, and she would like you just to mention how uh, our viewing audience can purchase uh, some of the posters and postcards from the museum if that's possible. And sure. several people actually uh, have that question. Sandy Everett. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay, well, great. Well, luckily, um, we have just opened recently a online store for the Hampton University Museum. We have a gift shop, the Laurel Tucker DePlessis gift shop, named for a former uh, curator at the museum and graduate of our museum studies program, and she actually started our museum store. So if you visit our website, um, and I think we would have that shared for you all, um, you can go to the store and you can purchase items, posters. We also have the International Review of African American Art, which is the probably the oldest African American um, art journal um, or journal for African American artists started by Samella Lewis, Dr. Samella Lewis. So we published that and we have uh, wonderful back issues of that. And I did notice somebody said my hand came really close to those pieces and do they accidentally, do, will I accidentally touch it? No, ma'am, I don't. I make, <laughs> I saw that in there and I had to laugh. I know it looked like it was closed, but no, I'm always um, spanking people, fingers when they, and, they, and I might actually, if you came in, I would actually probably pop you. So no, we're, we're very careful about that. <laughs> you know, there's never enough time um, when the subject is art, if you all are as in love with the art world and the artists as I. Um, so we're going to have to wrap this Q&A up um, and get ready for the second part of the tour. We never even got to the Harlem Renaissance artists and Elizabeth Catlin and Archibald Motley, but I will um, ask you to address one question from that uh, group of artists, just briefly if you can, and it's about uh, John Biggers and the rationale for the shotgun houses. Um, 
a little bit about why the shotgun houses were a common subject in his work. Well, you know, if you live in the South and um, West, you know, in Texas and where he was from, uh, there were shotgun houses. Shotgun houses are houses that you would find predominantly in a black neighborhood and they're called a shotgun house because you could see right through it. So you go through the front door and you would see the back door. So if someone shot a gun, a shotgun, you would see that. John, um, as I mentioned, uh, when he was here at Hampton, they were really uh, taught to look at their own communities and their own culture. And so he saw those houses in Gastonia. He saw them in Houston, where he worked for years, starting the art department at Texas Southern. And um, the shotgun houses are still very uh, pre prevalent in Houston, and they have actually, um, around the neighborhood of Texas Southern, made them into art colonies and different things uh, for artists. So the shotgun house, I think uh, many of us probably should have heard of them uh, if you're, again, from the South. So. All right. And before we wrap it up and turn it over to our esteemed Eastern Area Program Director, Dr. V, we want to know, at some point in time, your tenure there is going to come to an end. What will be your legacy? What will you leave behind? What mark do you plan to make as Hampton University's museum director during this period of time? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I hope that my legacy will be that I will introduce more African-American, um, particularly youth, young people to the field to uh, the field and uh, of museums and what the variety of jobs and positions are there because we really need to be the ones that are taking care of our culture. Um, early on, I, I had some mentors who were folklorists and they did a lot of work on African-American culture and history and they were not given the props that they deserve. And so I really encourage um, our young people to not only go to school for museum studies or conservation, but to also to get the credentials, to get that PhD or that doctorate behind them to help, um, I guess, just to, to, to make sure that they're getting the, the props. Because I've seen many people who are out there doing the work and it is just taken away from us. So. I hope that would be my legacy through the beauty and the history of Hampton's collection to, to, to encourage people to do that. Well, thank you so much again for that wonderful tour. And it would take me all day to just express the sentiments of appreciation the Eastern area of the Lynx um, has for your efforts and your entire team, uh, Kalante Turner, the curator, and also your fellows, who we're going to hear more from if you stay on for part yes. two, which is a workshop. Uh, speaking of the workshop in our transition, I'd like to now introduce um, our former uh, chair of the Arts Facet, who has been elevated to the esteem role as the Eastern Area Program uh, Director, responsible for not only the Arts Facet, but all of our arts facets and several of them through integrated programming efforts for this event uh, were featured today. So um, if none other than the wonderful Anna Maria Bishop Harris could please join me in the museum rotunda, I would very much appreciate it at this time. Anna Maria. Valerie, as usual, you have done a yeoman's job. You are an absolute genius at this. This is truly your wheelhouse, and I congratulate you. I congratulate Carol Seals Council, our marvelous arts chair. I also must thank, I am remiss if I don't always remember our technology team and our communications team. All you beautiful link sisters I see in the chat, I see you from California to North Carolina, and it warms my heart. I see Southern Girl Magic in the house and I'm from Jackson, Mississippi, migrated to New York, and was accepted at Hampton University. But my parents, who were paying my college tuition, didn't want me quite that far. So I wound up at Howard instead. 
probably a good thing because I probably would have spent half the day in the museum daydreaming. It is such a magnificent, magnificent place that truly transports you back to Africa and shows you how our culture is so rich with divine history. Dr. Vanessa, you are incredible and your legacy is rich. And I want to thank you for sharing that legacy with the members of the Eastern Area Lincoln, many of you across the country. So I will leave it there. I will tell you that the art is what separates everything. Creativity, love, that is what art brings, especially during these turbulent times. So I want to thank all of you for attending. I want to thank the entire staff at Hampton. Thank you for being our partner. Valerie, back to you. Thank you so much for coming in today, Anna Maria. We always feel honored to have you present and also to um, Madam Eastern Director, Eastern Area Director, Shawana Tucker Sims. Uh, at this time though, we are going to transition from our museum tour. We hope you won't leave us. We are going to give you a chance to take a bio break, but we hope you'll all come back um, shortly and jo join our tour. But at this time, we are going to ask the local president of the Hampton, Virginia chapter of the Lynx, to come bring greetings and share a little bit locally about what's happening for Black History Month and her neck of the woods. Joyce Melvin Jones, please join me. Well, greetings. On behalf of the Hampton, Virginia chapter of the Lynx, I bring you greetings. The Hampton chapter was chartered in March. 1952. So we celebrate our Platinum Jubilee beginning next month, 70 years of friendship and service. I also welcome you to the city of Hampton, founded in 1610. Hampton is the oldest continuous English speaking settlement in America and home to many firsts, home to America's first free public education, first trained astronauts at the Hampton NASA, and home to many hidden gems, including hidden figure Katherine Johnson. And finally, again, welcome to Hampton University. You heard the greeting earlier from Dr. William R. Harvey, president of Hampton University. However, as an alumna of this great university, my greetings would not be complete without mention of my home by the sea, especially in light of our purpose today. And now to give you a taste of Hampton, if you would share the slide, I invite you to another hidden gem, Mango Mango, a Simply Panache Bistro. Next slide. Mango Mango is located in the FIBA section of, of the city of Hampton. And it serves uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, Monday through Saturday and Sunday brunch. Next slide. Here you see the owner celebrating a victory on the popular television show, Shark Tank. Uh, while no shark invested, uh, their famous Mango Mango preserves were featured on QVC and sold out five times. The owners used their earnings to open the restaurant and we are so happy they invested in the Hampton community. The Mango Mango preserves are so famous that they are now commercially manufactured. The preserves can be found in Whole Foods and other specialty gourmet stores nationwide. So I have these preserves and what a treat. Next slide. Mango Mango's menus are crafted from three distinct cuisines, French, Creole, and Neo Soul. Next slide. So we ask you to stop by when you're in Hampton to sample the popular Mango Mango smoothies. Or next slide, the mango mango ginger shrimp. And speaking of treats, that concludes the slides. Speaking of treats, I have another treat for you today. 
one of the Hampton chapter of the Lynx Young Masters 2.0 winners, Kirsten Gonzalez on violin and her sister Kendall Gonzalez on cello performing a duet. Please enjoy. Good evening, everyone. Tonight we'll perform Passacalia by Handel Halverson. Thank you and enjoy. Did that really just end? My goodness, my goodness. We could have listened to the, the talent of those young ladies what all day. Mean? We could have listened to the talent of those ladies all day. What a wonderful, wonderful rendition. Um, we are going to uh, come back to the program and start the student workshop component. We promised you that we'd start at 110. We're a little behind, uh, but that's okay. We really need to make time, as we heard earlier, for our youth, for our talented Young Master 2.0 students. And so thank you all for hanging in there with us. Uh, hopefully you had a chance to get a bio break, to um, get some water. And at this time, we are going to talk about part two of the program today, which is a student workshop. So by the way, many of you asked about this particular session um, and how many you've missed. Again, this is our fifth season. We started this uh, during the pandemic. This was our Eastern Area Arts Pandemic Pivot. And so season five, episode one is where we are. And we're just wonderful to introduce um, our student workshop 
component uh, into the model with Hampton University Museum at the helm. But before I do so and turn it back over to Hampton to start, uh, to start this part, I want to formally introduce Dr. Vanessa Thaxton Ward. Um, some of you might not have been on for the first session, and she really does deserve a brief introduction. Um, and I'll be brief, but you, you, I want to let you all know that she is the, the wonderful director of the Hampton University Museum. And before that, she was the director of York Valley Bailey Museum at Penn Center on St. Helena Island in South, South Carolina. Uh, she has secured lots of funding for, from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, Save America's Treasures, uh, lots of foundations. Um, just to make sure that the museum remains financially secure. She is also publisher of the International Review of African American Art and has curated exhibitions with various artists from Hanson's collection like Margot Humphrey, Elizabeth Catlett, John Biggers, and several others. <clears throat> Most recently, um, she was selected as a uh, a member of the CCL, the Center for Curatorial Leadership, uh, the class of 2022 in New York City. She came here to learn with other subject experts in the field. And we're very proud of her to have represented us uh, in the class of 2022. So congratulations for that, Dr. Thaxton Ward. Um, she did receive her PhD in American studies, concentrating in African American material culture from the College of William and Mary uh, in Virginia, and also her Master's of Arts and Museum and Archival Studies from Hampton. And this is the workshop. There are students on that are curious about the backgrounds of the art uh, practitioners. So it's important to hear a little bit more about how Dr. Thaxton Ward got to be where she is today. So thank you for allowing me to do a deep dive into her background. And at this time, she's going to come forward and talk about part two along with her team. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Thaxton Ward, to the curator, Kalante, and the fellows. Thank you all. Okay. Great, good afternoon. And I'm going to keep my part brief because you all need to hear from these fabulous people that are a part of the Hampton University Museum team. But a couple of years ago, uh, Dr. Kimberly Gant, who was the former uh, curator of contemporary art, uh, moved to the Norfolk area to work at the Chrysler Museum of Art. And we immediately made contact and wanted to do a partnership, to create a partnership. And Dr. Gant is um, one of the few African-American uh, art history uh, professionals and who specializes in African art. So we came together uh, for a couple of years to pull together a grant that we were funded $500,000 from the Mellon Foundation to work on diversity and inclusion in the museum field. And so we were able to hire um, a curatorial fellow as well as a conservation fellow uh, to do this work. On a very important uh, collection that Hampton has, uh, we received in 1968 a donation of works from the Harmon Foundation, which many of the pieces you saw on display, but which you don't have the opportunity to see is the Martin African Art Collection. And they will uh, probably share a little more of that information um, when they talk about how they became curators and conservators. Uh, Mr. Kalante Turner is our curator of collections. We are so excited to have him on board. He's been with us, uh, I guess, two years now with the beginning of the pandemic. And um, he has brought a lot to, to the table. So I'm going to turn it over, I think I've talked long enough, um, to this team so that they can share with you. And uh, Mr. Turner is going to be your facilitator. And I know that Tashay Smith and Elizabeth Robson, Robson, I'm sorry, Elizabeth, that are um, wonderful additions to the museum staff right now. So take it away, guys. Proud of you. <laughs> 
Thank you, Dr. Thaxton Ward. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Kalante Turner, as was just said. Um, I'm the Curator of Collections here at the Hampton University Museum, and I will help uh, moderate this um, session. I'm joined by my fabulous colleagues, Tasha and Elizabeth, who will introduce themselves in just a moment. Um, I just want to take a few seconds to just say thank you all for joining us for our discussion today, and thank you in particular to the Lynx Incorporated for making this all happen. Um, but before we jump into our breakout sessions today, we wanted to take about 10 minutes or so to introduce ourselves and talk about our journey and how and why we chose this field. And so I will let Tashay start us off. Hello, thank you, Kalante and Dr. Uh, Daxon Ward. Um, and of course, the links for inviting us to this very special engagement. Uh, as was said before, this is season five, so happy to be a part <laughs> of this. <laughs> and doing this great work. Um, so kind of what Kalante was talking about before is um, our career paths is what we're gonna be talking about. And like any career path, um, being a curator leads you through many winding paths. So my path actually started in 2013 when I attended Manhattanville College in Purchase, New York. And I majored in history, minored in museum studies um, in hopes of being a curator. I always knew I wanted to be a curator um, and so going to Manhattanville was my first step, and it was great because it taught me a lot of research skills um, and exhibition skills as well. So I was able to create a five-site African-American walking tour while I was attending that college and also put on an art exhibition with other classmates. Now, of course, uh, the path continues to wind, and I actually took a, a year off to do some freelance and eventually start my museum career, not in curatorial, but in education. In 2017, I became the education coordinator for the Hudson River Maritime Museum. So although I shifted my focus from curation to education, it was still very valuable. There, I was able to still do um, exhibition labels and actually make them more interactive for kids. And so I was there for about a year. And then in 2018, I decided to go back to school for my master's degree, where I went to the Cooperstown graduate program in Cooperstown, New York. Uh, you might be familiar with it. It's where the Baseball Hall of Fame is. Um, and I decided to do a two-year program in museum studies. Um, and this program is not very specific. It's very general. So you do things from fundraising to education to collection management. So you kind of get a breath of everything. Um, but that was also a great experience that I had there because I was able to take a cu curatorial class on African American art, which was very amazing, and also intern at the American Civil War Museum located in Richmond, Virginia, where I was able to do an, an exhibit proposal that incorporated both art and history. Um, so again, two year program, and I actually stayed on that path of education and went to be manager of public programs for the Mattituck Museum, which is actually located in um, Waterbury, Connecticut. And I was there for, again, about a year. And so I decided I wanted to, you know, go back into curatorial work. So now I am here as the curatorial fellow um, for both Hampton University Museum and the Chrysler Museum. So we kind of know that cliche that it's not about the destination, but it's the journey, but it's, it's very true, the journey is very amazing with, with some ups and downs. And even here, I haven't highlighted all that I have done, projects, internships, and also the people that have helped me along the way. So there's definitely much more in the journey that I can actually talk about if there's any questions in the breakout session. Um, and for my breakout session, again, I'm gonna be talking about curatorial work, what is a curator, what does a curator do, and also my role as a curatorial fellow um, during this time. So that's just a little bit about me. Awesome, thank you, Tashe. Elizabeth? Thanks, Kenlante, and thank you to the Lynx for organizing this wonderful event. I'm really happy to be included. And um, yeah, just to give you uh, a little bit about my background, my path into art conservation um, started when I was in my senior year as an undergrad student at Colgate University, which is in upstate New York. And I was majoring in art history and French, and I didn't know yet what I was going to do when I graduated. Um, I wanted my career to maybe include more scientific elements, but 
uh, since I was good at those subjects, but I, I knew I didn't want to be a doctor or an engineer, so I had been studying art, which I was very passionate about, and I started researching careers in the art field and came across several schools offering master's degrees in art conservation, which uh, combines art history, studio art, and chemistry. And I immediately knew that this was the path that I wanted to take. So I started trying to figure out how to get all of the requirements to apply to these graduate programs. And I also emailed um, several places and applied to several internships. And I was accepted by Colonial Williamsburg in the Archaeological Conservation Lab to do a six-week program with them that summer after graduation. Um, and there I was also able to meet conservators of many other specialties. They have nine different conservation labs in one building, um, uh, from wooden artifacts, paintings, paper, furniture, uh, textiles, everything. So I was able to volunteer with some of those uh, conservators as well uh, in Virginia at Colonial Williamsburg. And uh, at the same time, I was taking chemistry classes, both online and at a local community college. Um, to get those requirements. And I also got in touch with the chief conservator of the Mariners Museum, which is in Newport News, Virginia, who at the time was Fred Wallace. And uh, he allowed me to shadow him for two half days per week, which was wonderful. And through him, I also met Belinda Carroll, who's his wife. And she was at the time a conservator at um, the Hampton University's Harvey Library. So with her, I worked on some architectural drawings and got some experience in paper conservation as well. And Fred also put me in touch with the local paintings conservator who uh, works out of her home on uh, artworks, both from individuals, private individuals, as well as institutional um, clients. And that kind of drew me into the painting side. And um, I, I was really, really drawn towards that specialty in particular. So I was eventually accepted to a master's program at Buffalo State College, and I'll talk more about the different uh, schools in the breakout session. So I went to Buffalo for two years, specialized in painting conservation, and um, did an internship in Florida at the Ringling Museum of Art. Uh, ended up back at Colony Williamsburg for two years, and then was just recently um, received this current fellowship uh, through, again, Hampton University and the Chrysler Museum, funded by the wonderful Mellon Foundation. So very happy to be uh, in this role and uh, excited to tell, tell you a little bit more about what it's involved so far. Um, and I'll also talk about what is conservation versus uh, restoration. It's another term that's sometimes used. Um, and I'll talk about some of the people that I've met that have helped me through my career. And um, uh, how to find local conservators uh, near you as well. Awesome. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so my journey has also taken a few turns. Um, that's kind of the common theme here. Um, but it kind of all started my senior year of high school. So during my senior year, um, I was lucky enough to have an internship at the Hampton University Museum um, funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And the goal of this particular internship was to expose local students, especially African-American students, to the museum field. Um, after graduating from high school, I went to Christopher Newport. And um, there I majored in studio art and double minored in art history um, and museum studies. Um, I was a visual artist before anything else. And so I kind of wanted to get like a well-rounded teaching and understanding of all of the many paths that you can go down in the art world. Um, while at um, Christopher Newport, I worked as a student manager for the two art galleries that they had. And then I also received another internship here at Hampton. Um, this time it was funded by the Luce Foundation. Um, graduating in 2017 from Christopher Newport, I took a year off to kind of save up and you know, figure out my next step. Then um, I went to, in 2018, I attended Georgetown University, where I was a part of the Art and Museum Studies Master's Program. Um, while at Georgetown, I got the chance to intern and work at several Smithsonian um, museums. Um, I also interned again at Hampton um, before graduating in fall of 2019. Um, after graduating, I worked in the education department um, at the um, Smithsonian Asian Art Museum before I was offer offered a position here at Hampton as the new curator of collections. Um, and I've been here since March of 2020, so at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and I chose this field primarily because, again, being a visual artist before anything else, um, I really love being surrounded by art. 
and um, especially, you know, artwork that relates to me and was created by people who look like me, because before having that field trip here back in, you know, senior year of high school, I had never been to an art museum, and I especially never seen artwork that was um, created by Black artists. Um, but I also believe that museums in particular have a unique quality in that, you know, if done correctly, they can become like really accessible spaces that can inspire and educate the, the audience. And um, I often think of exhibitions as being like movies. And so curators kind of act as like film directors. So we are in a really special position to tell these really important stories and spark conversations that can, you know, really make a difference. And so from here, I want to share my screen. One second. Because today in our conversation, you may hear us say the term modern African art quite a bit. Um, but what is modern African art and how is it different from other types of art? And um, of course, this deals heavily with our um, project that we're working on, the Mellon Foundation um, um, project. So first off, um, whenever you hear modern art, it can mean many different things depending on the culture or geographic location you're talking about or even the kind of art you're referring to. Um, because every kind of art, whether it's the visual arts, dance, music, film, even literature, they all have different definitions of what they consider um, modern for their specific mediums. So for the, um, so the grounded in the um, visual arts movement in America, Many scholars will classify modern, modern art as artwork that was created primarily between the 1940s, particularly with the, um, the end of World War II in 1945, going all the way into the late 1970s. For African-American artists working in this time period, um, many of them were either raised during that Renaissance period, so like the 1920s, 1930s, and or trained by Renaissance artists themselves, so people like um, Charles Austin and Augusta Savage. Um, much of the content these modern um, African American artists were representing in their work um, dealt heavily with themes of um, like social and political change, technology and innovations in society, and various freedom movements, especially pan African movements, which often sought to uplift and advocate for people of African descent all around the world. Um, not to mention, um, this is also where you start to see more and more artists working within abstraction. So um, often their work was more focused on the process of creating rather than um, the actual product or the creation itself. And so the same goes for um, modern art in various countries throughout Africa during this time period, because while these changes were happening in America, they were again happening in various places all throughout Africa. Modern African art is greatly influenced by liberation efforts and overall social, political, and economic changes in society. Um, a few of the themes uh, myself and the fellows have just seen at this point for the Mellon Project um, deal with themes of religion, um, the traditional versus the contemporary, um, relationships between different generations, and overall major shifts in society and ways of thinking. And these two artists you see in the center here um, are just two of the many artists we have in this particular um, collection that we're looking at. Um, so uh, Mr. Skunder Bakasian, who is Ethiopian, and Mr. Ben Nwomu, who is Nigerian. Okay, and from here, we're going to jump into our breakout sessions and um, have some real fun. Okay, and for those that are just joining, um, if you previously selected that you wanted to attend a breakout session, you have been pre-assigned to a breakout room. If you haven't, don't worry. The only thing you need to do is look in the chat. There is a link along with the meeting ID and password and just simply type it in. You're gonna leave this webinar because you don't right now have the ability to speak at all and we want you to interact. So we need to take you to a Zoom meeting scenario. So you're just gonna join the meeting ID and webinar that's down at the bottom. I just repasted it in case it's not handy and pretend that you're leaving the museum now and you're walking across campus to find the classroom where your actual workshops are gonna be held. So I'll see you there. And if you get lost, someone will be remain behind in this session to help you out. So let's see if we can quickly get to our breakout room sessions in less than five minutes. 
and uh, we'll hope to see you all in place over there. And we'll wrap up over there too, so no worries. <laughs>